Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing as well as can be, uh, given everything that's going on. As we've all heard, in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak, there's been a worldwide shortage of some critical medical supplies. The N95 respirator mask is uh, one of the items that's in extremely short supply right now. Uh, it's been identified as one of the only disposable respirators that's effective in helping to block the transmission of the virus. After some research, we were able to find a few uh, DIY 3D printed uh, N95 substitutes in PPE communities that claim to offer some protection when no N95 is available. One design that stood out was from copper3d.com. We'll leave a link in the description. Um, the design is open sourced, it's simple. The print is relatively fast and easy. Uh, and the product is reusable and can be shipped in a flat pack. Copper3D.com on their website says that this design is only intended to be a prototype and not a final product. Uh, they're currently taking notes from members of the community, making improvements to their designs. And from what I understand, they're going to be uh, releasing a version two very soon. Now, a bit of a disclaimer here. We're not medical professionals, so we can't speak to the efficacy of these devices. Copper3D.com claims that uh, this mask design is only viable if it's printed using Plactiv, which is their proprietary brand of antimicrobial uh, PLA 3D printer filament. Once again, the idea here is that these devices are a last resort measure. Uh, only to be used when no N95 or equivalent is available. Um, thinking is that some form of protection is better than nothing at all. When using these devices, people should by no means feel invulnerable to the obvious risks uh, and should continue to act responsibly, practice uh, good hygiene, social distancing, and continue to attempt to limit exposure as much as possible. Now, with all that said, let's dive in. Here's copper3d.com slash hack the pandemic. On this page, you'll find the most recent design of the copper 3D mask and some print and assembly instructions. There's no CAD data here. It's just STL files, but they're good to go. So if that's the way you want to run, you just download the files and drop them into your favorite 3D printer software. Here we see we're using Simplify 3D and the stuff just goes in and it prints great. We can see that the largest component of this print, which is the main body of the mask, fits easily on the bed of the Maker Gear M2, and there's a lot of room to spare. The M2 is a pretty standard bed size, so you shouldn't have any problems with build size on this. This is an unmodded print of the original Copper 3D design. After a few tests, we noticed a couple of issues that were pretty easily solvable with a little bit of time in CAD, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, here we can just see some issues with the cap. There were some printing failures due to long spans and some rigidity issues in the walls of the port. Uh, there were some failures in the threading, etc. We're using SolidWorks for all of our CAD work on this. So basically what we did was just bring in the STL file of the original design and trace it out. Then we modified our SolidWorks model. So the first issue that we noticed on our test prints was that it was incredibly hard to breathe through one port. The second problem was some rigidity issues in the port walls. If you heat it up and cool it down a few times when you were forming it to your face, we noticed that the port would start to warp and this would affect the threading and the, the overall fit and seal of the cap. Now our solve for this was a redesign of the cap and thread assembly. We found that once we thickened those port walls and carefully redesigned the tolerances on the thread, we were getting a much more confident fit with the screw cap. The print was able to withstand a lot more heating and cooling cycles uh, without failure in the port areas. For our tests, we were using a regular PLA-based 3D printer filament, uh, which is not recommended for final printing of these, these devices. Again, in Copper 3D's documentation, they suggest you use Plactiv. Uh, as with many things these days, Plactiv is in pretty short supply and high demand. Uh, you can find suppliers that will source it for you, but currently the wait times are pretty long. 
And we found a lot of information out there that suggests that other FDA approved antimicrobial materials could be used in place of Plactiv if it can't be sourced. We managed to find something called Pyramid, which uh, does have an FDA approval, it is antimicrobial, and it's PLA based filament. We'll be moving on to Pyramid while we wait for our shipment of Plactiv to arrive. One of our 3D printing suppliers suggested that we try an antimicrobial PETG filament. Uh, PETG is interesting because right out of the box, it's food safe. It's also more pliable and less brittle than PLA. It's more heat resistant and resistant to chemicals. These 3D printed masks require sterilization after a certain amount of use. Uh, that involves submerging the printed components in an alcohol bath. Apparently a PETG based material will hold up much better during the cleaning cycles to alcohol than a PLA based material would. One of two methods can be used to form the mask to the user when it's ready to go. The first is submerging the mask in a hot water bath. The temperature should be between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. When the mask comes to a threshold temperature, the consistency transforms to something that resembles like a wet lasagna noodle. Uh, we opted for the second method, which is applying heat to localized areas of the mask body. This can be done with a hairdryer or a low powered heat gun. The process in both cases is a little bit time consuming, but relatively simple. The first step is to fold the side flaps back along the ribs on the nose section to roughly match the user's face. The second step is to heat up the bottom flap so that the connection point acts as a bit of a hinge. The idea here is to match the transition angle and the contours of the chin and the jaw. This involves tucking the side edges of the bottom flap into the upper section of the mask. Now it's time to move on to the second phase, which is uh, creating a seal. This involves reheating the outer edge of the mask, starting at the throat and working our way up around the perimeter towards the nose. It's important to be careful here because prolonged exposure to the heated plastic could give you a, a bit of a burn, which I experienced a couple of times in, in my experiments. Once the mask has been properly fitted to the user's face, you're going to find some pretty large gaps where the panels have been folded and tucked, uh, mainly in the chin area and the nose area. There's plenty of suggestions out there on how to seal this up. Uh, what we found works best is to just run a raw piece of filament of the same material along the gap and weld the seam shut using a small soldering iron. Not pictured here was the additional seal that we added. We suggest running a bead of silicone along the bridge of the nose and the bottom of the jaw. Uh, these are areas that we found were the most prone to leakage. The original documentation in the community have offered plenty of suggestions on what to use to fill the ports for filtration material. The most popular option seems to be the 3D printed antimicrobial plactic disc, which is included in the STL files sandwiched between one layer of cotton padding and one layer of non-woven polypropylene. The cotton padding can be sourced from any regular makeup removal pad and cut down to size. And the non-woven polypropylene can be sourced from a reusable grocery bag. Another option that was provided was actually to cut down an N95 mask uh, and load the ports with one layer of N95 material. In this configuration, one N95 mask could potentially be used for several reloads of one reusable mask, or it could be used to load several masks at the same time. As always, if you have any questions regarding anything in this video, please comment and we'll respond to you as soon as possible. We're lucky we live in a time where we're surrounded by technology that can help us endure and limit the severity of situations like this. Please be responsible and follow the guidelines set out by your government and the WHO. This virus has staggering implications if left to spread without intervention. Individuals can have a dramatic influence on the severity of the outcome of the crisis. Please do everything you can to distance yourself from others. We'll come out of this and connect on the other side. In the meantime, those of us with loved ones at high risk are counting on you.